And uh, our last speaker in this session is Mohammad. Mohammad Al Shahed is a writer, curator, and critic of, of architecture. Uh, he is an author of Cairo since 1900 and uh, an ar architectural guide uh, in uh, 2020, uh, and uh, was a cur curator of Cairo Modern at New York Center for Architecture in 2021 and 2022. He earned a master from MIT's uh, Aga Khan program for Islamic architecture and a PhD from N um, NYU's Department of Middle East Eastern Studies. He is the curator of British Museum uh, Modern Egypt Project and uh, of Modernist indig ind Indigenation. Uh, Egypt's winning pavilion at the 2080s London Design Biennial in 19, uh, 1990, in 2019, sorry, um, Apollo magazine named him among the 40s influential thinkers and artists in the Middle East. In 2011, he founded um, Carbo, um, Cairo Observer, a fluid project looking to stimulating public debates around the issue of architecture, heritage, and urbanism. Um, thank you, Mohammed. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. I always feel very awkward during present uh, introductions uh, yeah. when you hear your past being regurgitated at you in one minute. Um, but I will speak about someone whose past has been kind of wiped out. Uh, nobody's been reading his biography. And his name is Said Karim. Uh, what you're looking at is his uh, business card uh, from time, sometime in the late 50s, early 1960s. And as you can see, there are three addresses. One is his... Um, uh, downtown Cairo office, uh, which caught fire in 1952 during protests against British occupation. Um, I'll get maybe back to some of these points later on. And then his villa, where he had a home office. And in that villa, uh, which was built in 1947-48, he spent seven years under house arrest from the mid-1960s. Um, uh, you can count the years until the presidency of Sadat. And then at the bottom, curiously, is a third, a second office uh, in what became Abu Dhabi uh, or the UAE today. Um, if I were to uh, sort of have a soundbite on what Eurocentrism is, I would say it's the, I wrote it down just now, it's the universalization of European provincialism in the sense of what we don't know doesn't exist. And then you universalize that idea. <laughs> so Sayyid Karim is one of those figures. Uh, who's been victim, I think, of, of that. Um, and the other point, maybe, uh, as just before I dive into his story, is that stories, we often talk about realities that turn into stories, but very little do we talk about stories and histories that then shape realities. So again, if you say, let's say, uh, a certain part of the world or every other non-Western culture is incapable of producing a certain kind of architecture, well, we've seen in the last several decades actual policies of neglect and so on make that a reality before the histories have been ever written. So what once, once upon a time, a, a racist connotation that uh, uh, these people are incapable of doing X, Y, and Z actually becomes fact on the ground later on. And Sayyid Karim, again, is a fascinating figure for me for this. This is his house, uh, a model of his house that was published in the mid 40s. Um, so this is where he spent seven years under house arrest. That's him with his wife and sister. Um, in that villa. He was a pretty prominent figure in Egyptian uh, modernity uh, in the sense of uh, a 30-year career of uh, hundreds of buildings, private and public, but also perhaps one of the first architects that um, established a practice regionally, which is why it's interesting that business card has that address in Abu Dhabi, um, because again, it's quite early when we see this. So um, he has, you know, most of the archive that remains of his work actually has works from the later half of his career, which is in Saudi Arabia and, and, and the Emirates, because the other, the earlier half was lost in that fire in 1952. Um, <clears throat> one of the reasons he's very interesting is that besides building quite a, a vast portfolio of buildings, um, he also published extensively and he had opinions, he had uh, theories, he had thoughts about architecture, which um, uh, includes uh, this book, uh, The Socialism of the Villa, that was developed in the 1950s, sort of his own way of presenting collective housing models, 
uh, which he actually implemented in many projects, uh, some more successful than others. Um, a lot of them are in Cairo. And because of their large scale, they haven't been demolished as the smaller projects, uh, like the villas. Um, what you see on the right is uh, Al Amara magazine, which uh, <clears throat> is considered, uh, as far as my research can tell so far, the, the first Arabic language journal dedicated to contemporary architecture anywhere in the world. Uh, it was published first in 1939 with quite uh, regular uh, issues and then various uh, political economic uh, uh, reasons made that sort of uh, frequency of the magazine less consistent. So in total, it was 67 issues. I would say it's still a pretty substantial published record of contemporary architecture, mostly focused on Egypt, but also um, with uh, with projects elsewhere, um, and to give you an example of the, sort of the the scope of the magazine, the only time he dedicated an entire issue to another country, it was Brazil in 1950, uh, an entire issue dedicated to that. So the point about Said Karim recently uh, passed in front of me uh, a proposal for a book on him. I've been working on Said Karim since 2010. Um, and then I saw recently, I was asked to review a proposal of, uh, for a book on him. So the way histories are actually written and shaped. And the point or the argument of that proposal is that he was a prophet of his Swiss professor. That he essentially, uh, what, what he practiced later on can, sort of, can be entirely explained by the fact that he uh, came to ETH Zurich in the 1930s. Um, so it's a very typical... Outdated, unfortunately, but again, these are the stories that have been presented with the most force uh, that, uh, you know, someone like him was incapable of producing what he went on to produce if it wasn't for an encounter with this one Swiss architect, uh, you know, which is very uh, typical. Um, you know, what misses, what's missing from that story is that when Sey Karim showed up in Zurich in 1933, the Nazis had just gotten into power next door. Um, and when I went to ETH Zurich and looked through the archive, I found out that he actually paid for an entire year before taking any credit points because they weren't sure that an Egyptian student is capable of receiving their knowledge or something like that. Um, so we're not talking about, uh, so he's certainly not a prophet of his professor, but he's also certainly not simply someone who sort of like drank European modernity and then went and spewed it elsewhere. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated than this. He, had, he was a student who faced difficulties, racism, um, <clears throat> and then went on and had a career. In fact, the, the record at ETH Zurich, uh, we're not even sure if he actually went all the way through graduation because he went initially for a master's, um, and then as the political situation, uh, well, everywhere was, was worsening, he stayed where he was and started a PhD. We don't know if he actually finished the PhD. It's very likely that he did rebel and leave uh, before actually completing. Um, and uh, when he returned to Cairo, he was faced with a British-dominated architecture school at Cairo University, where the usual thing, considering that at the time, he was the first uh, Egyptian architect to pursue a PhD, whether he finished it or not, he went on in his own writings to say that he finished it, but we don't know. Um, he, the natural thing would have been to go back and to teach at the School of Architecture in Cairo, but he faced a lot of difficulties there. So it's, it's a much more complicated story than simple uh, sort of uh, Euro uh, transition or um, spreading of European ideas. And his portfolio is quite diverse. These are some of these buildings that uh, have this idea of socialist, uh, the socialist villa, where there is uh, sort of duplexes and units for less, um, you know, people who have less economic means mixed in with uh, penthouse villa and the same structure. So he had some interesting ideas that were implemented in buildings like this. These are some of his projects outside of Egypt. Uh, the bottom is the Ministry of Defense in Riyadh, uh, the end of the 40s, pretty early, um, and a publishing house also in Riyadh, in Saudi Arabia. Um, these are some of his theoretical projects that were never um, implemented, such as, uh, again, socialist uh, villas for New Baghdad. Um, and then he went even further with some, um, you know, more theoretical ideas, such as this notion of a city that can be based on a cell, which is this structure, uh, uh, a, a series of those form a neighborhood, and then a series of those neighborhoods form a, a town. 
Um, and this can potentially be sort of expanded, replicated uh, at various scales. Um, again, these are some some of the more theoretical ideas. Um, well, what's really interesting about him is his career starts in Zurich in 1933 in a very racist and difficult situation. Uh, and it ends in Cairo in a very, well, in an encounter with, with a Nazi, actually. Um, and I'll jump right into this because of time. Um, so this was a major project that he had planned, which was at the time, at the same time as Chandigarh and Brasilia, uh, meant to be a new modernist capital city for Egypt, which as you may be following, Egypt has been building a new city, capital city in the last whatever many years, five, six, seven years, um, very questionable design and motives. But in this case, there was a lot of energy and excitement over this, which was actually built, uh, but um, mostly without his consent, because midway through, he was put under this house arrest. The centerpiece of the city is a stadium that you can see in this model. And um, I'll skip this. And the stadium, unfortunately, the design of the centerpiece of his new city went to this architect, uh, Werner Mark, who actually designed the stadium for the 1936 Nazi Olympics. So somehow this Egyptian, uh, not only did his career start with an encounter too close with Nazism, uh, it ends in his own country in 1965. So two year, uh, 20 years after uh, World War II had ended, at the hands of a Nazi architect who, because of European diplomatic pressures and the way Europeans use diplomacy to push their experts, to push their products, to push their architects, uh, you know, the most prominent architect in Egypt uh, and perhaps even uh, across the region at the time uh, lost his career. He lived, he lived for another 50 years, um, um, a, a broken man. Uh, so. Um, so I think just in thinking about Eurocentrism, it's not just in terms of the stories, but also the real dynamics. You know, why did why does uh, a literal Nazi architect have better chances at building a stadium, the most prominent stadium in supposedly a post-colonial country like Egypt, than the most important architect in his own country? It's a question we should all ponder because it's still happening, uh, uh, by the way, in different versions until today. In the 2011 revolution in uh, I still call it a revolution in Egypt, which has been squashed by the West and its allies. Um, one of the first events that the Grote Institute hosted was about the future of Cairo and who did they invite? Who did they think was a genius uh, kind of idea to invite? It was Albert Speer Jr. Um, shameless, you know, <laughs> this is completely shameless. This is 2011. Um, anyways, um, I tried to resurrect the story of Sayyid Karim and Varer's interventions. This is the installation at the London Design Biennale that you mentioned that won for that year. Even this encounter, and I would love to talk more about it. Here's an Egyptian trying to tell a story about basically a career that was destroyed because of imperialism and how it operates. But I have to raise the money to rent the room in Somerset House, which once hosted the British Navy, which once bombed my city, <laughs> you know? So the, the realities of imperialism are really very much present until today. And of course, this is the textbook uh, of uh, architecture history that I studied, uh, the William uh, Curtis book. And in it, uh, you know, he repeats the narrative that you both have presented in different ways, which is that modern architecture was created in Western industrialized countries uh, where then avant-garde the clique, and then it went out, let, a, let the rays of the sun out of Europe. Um, in another intervention, this exhibit uh, that was in New York, uh, I actually tried to have Sayyid Karim's words respond to, uh, to Curtis. So on one wall was that uh, was, was this quote uh, by Curtis, and on the opposite wall was Sayyid Karim actually reflecting on what it is, what is an architectural style, because it would actually undo this uh, obsession with modernism as something that sort of came out of thin air and then it became something to be exported out of that. Say Kerim's perspective is much more actually grounded in, in a reality. He says, architectural styles have always been the product of the materials and technologies that the builders, the societies had access to. So uh, to be fixated on, let's say, certain kind of elements the width of an arch, the thickness of a wall as an architectural style that belongs to a certain type of society at a certain time and place, and then freeze it in that, that's that's completely ahistorical. So it's a nice way to think about how these architects uh, sometimes not knowing 
what would be said about their work later on can actually be used uh, to counter these arguments. Um, I just want to close with uh, the only uh, book that's available really on contemporary architecture in the Arab states is by a German art uh, historian, Udo Kulterman. It's a very odd uh, book, um, but it carries a lot of the same uh, DNA of the historians like Curtis before him, who are much more widely read. But what's, what I find interesting also about uh, about Udo Kulterman is his able as a German art historian to write books about Japan, the Middle East, um, uh, the 70s. It's it's really uh, like if I tried to do this today, nobody would take me seriously. But a German 30, 40, 50 years ago can write about really everything, you know, and um, and these are the variety of, of African architectures. He wrote about Africa, Japan, the Middle East, uh, and many more, and world architecture in general. Um, and when it comes to Egypt, in his book about uh, contemporary architecture in the Middle East, figures such as Sayyid Karim are completely wiped out. So one of the most accomplished architects is completely wiped out because precisely of the narrative that he's seen as merely a prophet of his Swiss professor, something that has absolutely no grounding in reality whatsoever. But that's enough to dismiss an entire career like that. And instead, these are the kinds of examples that are given from Egypt because they're seen as a kind of revival of uh, an Arab identity and so on. So this was kind of regionalism coming back uh, in the 70s and 80s. So that's what was celebrated. And to me, this is nothing more than maintaining the same old storyline that we see in the Tree of Architecture by Bannister Fletcher, which is non-historical styles, they always have to look like this, and then the historical styles are the European ones that then become other things. Um, so again, it's a kind of a long history that persists. And to close, I think it might be interesting to consider how did the British write about their own architecture, or how did someone write about British architecture? And there we have the example of uh, uh, Pevsner's, um, how many volumes is it? 46 volumes, uh, uh, architectural guides for the buildings of England. Totally different approach. He literally went street to street, town to town, building by building, and listed them without an evaluation of what is uh, British and what is not British. Um, well, that was how I, that's what I think I, I, the work of a historian should be. And in fact, within the Middle East, there's a long history of this. Uh, the most prominent would be uh, uh, Al-Makrizi, um, if we go back uh, to the 15th century, but also um, uh, Ali Pasha Mubarak, who literally also did the same thing. He went street to street, town to town, listed the buildings, described them, and that's history, without imposing an evaluation of what's Egyptian, what's not Egyptian. Um, and I tried to incorporate this in my, in my work uh, in various ways. So this timeline was incorporated in the exhibition in New York, where I tried to piece, place the 20 buildings that were highlighted in the exhibition within a kind of a, a history, an ongoing history that includes influences such as politics, such as, um, well, other forms of, of um, well, other factors that really shape these histories. Um, and the end, just to close, I've proposed in this exhibit five points toward decolonizing the history of architecture, which I thought it's interesting to bring up in this context for today's event. Um, and they're, I think they're pretty straightforward. One is to recognize that history is not a linear progression of architect styles. Um, that's not really how it works, and we can see this before our own eyes today. Um, to accept that um, actually Eurocentrism is a form of primitivism. So Eurocentrism always posits itself as the position from which it can decide what's primitive and what's not. But by assuming that position, that's actually kind of a form of primitivism in itself. Uh, because you assume that you're just better than everybody else, and that's not exactly how it works. Um, and uh, that architectural knowledge needs to be, production needs to be decentered. We can't keep talking about decolonizing knowledge production, but still do it from institutions like the AA or Yale or Harvard. Uh, that's, that's, that within itself is kind of perpetuating uh, the centerism of, of knowledge production in the same old colonial uh, capitals. Um, and to accept that today's global economy actually has a lot of influence in terms of how meaning and value are decided to buildings that get included or excluded in histories. And one way to actually counter this, if you were really serious about decolonizing, would be to remove this, to allow communities to decide what has value and what it means, and they write their own histories. And in order to do this, we need to have institutions uh, to do this, again, not to, to center this production of knowledge in London and New York. So with that, I close. Thank you.